African father in America. Tujikaze, tujikaze, jikaze. Tujikaze, tujikaze. Greetings, everybody. My name is Sam Java Mikela. I'm excited to be here with you. And today we are going to be talking about youth activism. When you think about youth activism, you know, names like Greta Thunberg, the 18-year-old uh, climate and environmental activist with Asperger's comes to mind. You also think about names like Vanessa Nakati, founder of a million activist stories uh, from Uganda. And when you go further down south the continent, uh, names like Mantati, Noshua come up. And today it's really a privilege to be here with Mantati Mloshua herself, who is the program lead at Magamba Network, an award-winning organization uh, using uh, forms of youth activism to build a, democra a democratic and just Zimbabwe. Uh, today we are going to learn about the story of Mantati. We are going to learn about why she is passionate about helping to build a Zimbabwe that uh, dignifies its people. We are going to talk about what a father figure means to Mantate, and uh, we are also going to talk about how Africa is currently being perceived and how we can change that narrative. And then we will talk about Women's History Month and uh, you know what Mantate thinks about it and who are some of the women she wants to give a shout out. And then uh, we will learn how you, our viewers and listeners of the African Father in America podcast, can stay connected with Mantati. And finally, Mantati will ask me one question to close our conversation today. With that, I want to thank you all who are joining us on YouTube for your patience. We were just a little late, a lot of technical situations. So, my dear Mantati, please uh, share with us a story when you were around 8, uh, eight to 12 years old, when you, you had this wish one day you will be an activist that is a voice for the oppressed in your community. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I think it's very exciting. This is my the second time in my entire life where I've shown up in a podcast that's led by men and centers around the, the responsibilities of men in our society. So it's really exciting to be here. Um, the one incident that I'll probably want to start with was when I was seven years old, and that was like my first year in primary school. So what had happened is that I'd not seen my dad like at, uh, until that age, I'd never seen my dad and he stayed in another country. Mm -hmm. So I left um, Zimbabwe in the, during my school break to go and meet my father. So one of the craziest things that happened was that when we were at the border between Zimbabwe and Botswana, we saw this man that looked as light in complexion as I was. He looked like my dad, right? Mm. So when I saw this man, my mom was joking and said, that's your dad. So I was so excited. I was happy. I went and hugged this man mm. and he laughed, you know, he wasn't my dad, but it was just one of those things where, okay. I'm going to hug you, but I'm not your dad type situation. Then we went and saw mm. my father and everything. Mm. The reason why I referenced this particular moment um, for me, I think it's that it's that realization that I had the privilege to, oh, okay, he's not my dad, but I then went on to meet my dad. But there's so many young people, not just in Zimbabwe, but in Africa, who don't have fathers, who don't get the opportunity to meet their fathers. So I think it's such a turning point for me because at that moment it felt like I needed to meet my dad right. to almost find myself. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, oh, I'll talk about it a bit later, but I didn't get to find what I was looking for, even though I met my dad. So I'm just looking at young people in Zimbabwe that grow up without, you know, father figures. And it's not just that about fathers, but it's about parents in general to say, when you grow up as a child without a father, without a mother, you start from zero. It's talking about the economic opportunities you get. You start from zero. There is no investment into your future financially, your academic future. It's almost like you're having to do it on your own. So a lot of young people are raised in that kind of setup. So part of what inspires my work today is just being able to build responsible leadership. Leadership starts at home. So just being able to build a generation of young people that take responsibility, whether it's women, it's men. Just being able to encourage that kind of space and also just the idea of inspiring women because I grew up in a space where, like I said, my dad wasn't around. Right. 
So the people that I saw around me, the people that supported me, it was my mother, my grandmother. So I think the inspiration for just standing up for women came from that space where I saw a lot of women raising their kids on their own. And I was like, oh, okay. So how do we begin to build the capacity of women, you know, to self-sufficiently manage that? So we were looking at how do we build the economic capacity of women to raise their families, but also looking at decision making to say, what laws are they in place that protect women when women are not in parliament to make those laws? It's a bummer. So part of the work that I'm doing is inspiring and building the capacity of women to be more involved in political processes because that's where decisions are made, where they decide how a woman, you know, accesses property, how a woman accesses economic opportunities. So when that is defined by men, it means that the single mother back home, like my mother, my grandmother that raised me, don't have the opportunity. So I think the inspiration comes from those kind of incidents in my life. Mm. Wow. So then uh, you're saying, you know, that when you're around seven is when you first had this idea that one day you will be speaking for those who are oppressed. I think I would, I would say I grew up with that. It didn't start at seven. But I think kind of at seven, that's when I, I was more conscious of certain injustices around me. Because as you're growing, you know, sometimes you don't realize that, oh, my dad is not around. What does that mean for me? But now grade seven, like that age seven was when I was now at school. So when you're now at school, people ask questions like, there is parents day. Where is your dad? You know, where is your mom? My mom was in South Africa trying to work so that I stayed at school. My dad was not in the picture there. So it's those moments when you're having to answer questions that you shouldn't actually be answering, but because that's where you are. So I think age seven is kind of where the consciousness to where I was and what it meant to have or not have a father or what it meant to have my mother working in South Africa while I was raised in Zimbabwe. So it's that kind of dynamic that made me more aware and become more interested in what does it mean for me? Yeah, you know, the reason I like to ask this question uh, is because when I was eight uh, is when I realized that my mother was raising us single-handedly. My father was there, but he was a polygamist. So he mostly lived in the past life. Uh, so from that age, you know, I started distributing milk and bread in our neighborhood with a bicycle. So it's it's one it's why I love just asking people that I interview on my podcast why what they were doing around that age because I think that's when you know you start discovering yourself and your purpose. You know? So then, how did you transform from you know this little seven-year-old girl who you know was being raised by strong women? How did you transform to now focusing on building a Zimbabwe that dignifies its people? And for those who don't know Zimbabwe right now, you know, Zimbabwe is where the late uh, President Robert Mugabe was uh, a long time the president. And now we have a new president, but there is still a lot of work that the leadership has to do. And so I feel that the role that youth activists will play in the work that you're doing is very, very critical. And I just want to, I want you for, to share with uh, our audience uh, and also our viewers, uh, you know, how you, you, you walk into this and why this is what you're focusing on. And some of the victories that you've had, some of the challenges, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, totally. Um, I think, like as I was saying that when I started grade one, um, that was like the age seven time, I think school kind of offered me the space to find myself. Like one of the things I noticed that I always talk about when I'm sharing my story is that I'm very talkative. Like that has been me since I was born. And you discover that when you're in a school that allows you to be as outspoken as you can be. You discover that in class, you become class monitor. You know, as you're growing through primary school, you become prefect, you get to represent students in this. As you transition into high school, you get exposed to extracurricular activities. So for my, my journey was really tracing my voice from a very young age. It was about how do I represent those that can't speak because I'm loud. So how do I use that, you know, to speak for those that are not as loud as I am? Yeah. So I remember that in high school, uh, when I started high school, um, it was the second year of my high school. 
um, there was an opportunity to write. There was an essay writing competition. At that time, it was for um, sixth form students, mm. but I was in second form. Mm. So what I did was, because I was very passionate about speaking and writing, and the competition was centered around then the Millennium Development Goals. Mm. So what I did was I entered that competition even though I wasn't qualified for it. And I remember that my, my essay centered around, you know, the issue of gender equality. I was always about that. So I was writing about the structure of our politics in Zim, looking at where women are politically. Mm -hmm. And I was just highlighting some of the incidents that felt to me like a disrespect of women in politics. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote at that time, I didn't think it was an amazing um, essay, you know, but I just wrote that essay and submitted it. And the shocking thing happened in the next year is that when the results came, mm -hmm. I was told that I actually was third place in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And I was the only junior to have entered the competition. So that kind of inspired me a lot to say, oh, okay, you've got something mm -hmm. that you don't need to wait for a certain age for. So we went to Harare and we got our prizes and things like that. Mm -hmm. When I came back, I started, you know, finding myself in those extracurriculars that centered around human rights. So we used to have a human rights club at school. We used to have a girl empowerment movement at school. We also used to have, you know, leaders today at school. So I was part of those moments and I was part of debate as well. So in all of those things, that it was always me kind of trying to position my voice and my ability to, you know, to be loud in a good way. So when I transitioned to the final two years of my high school, I was still, you know, junior parliament. Um, so Zimbabwe has a system of, you know, parliament where we, we've got young people that campaign for office and get into office to mirror the work of senior politicians. So I was a junior member of parliament and part of what we were doing was, you know, ad advocating for issues affecting young people that are in schools within our constituencies. Mm -hmm. So again, it's about tracing, you know, the voice and the ability to stand up for people. At that point, it was students. So naturally, you're like, okay, this is kind of my energy. So I, I knew at that point that this is something I want to do for life, where I'm standing in for people. I'm able to spotlight issues affecting people. So when I stepped out of high school, I continued the journey, worked within civil society organizations, and ran my own personal project as well. So all of the projects that I did were about building the capacity of young people, first to speak about their issues. Mm -hmm. Because when you speak about their issues, you're challenging your leaders to do something, to listen to you, and you're holding them accountable as well. So that's kind of how I enter this kind of space where I'm saying, I don't want it to just be mandata with the voice. I want it to be young people that have the knowledge and the skills and know the, the kind of pathways they need to follow to hold their leaders to account. So it continued up to now. This is almost like four or five years later. And I'm doing that at a larger scale now. But at the end of the day, I think the premise is how do we build capacity? Because when we build capacity, we empower young people and women to actually do it for themselves. Because I can't be there in all of those communities that I work in. But when you're able to leave people, you know, with the ability to question their leaders, the ability to document their stories and share them online, mm -hmm. I think you're giving them something that you don't need to be there to ensure that they continue doing. So I think that's how I showed up in this kind of picture of social justice. Right. Wow. Yeah, I remember the days when I was also in high school in Kenya, debating, and really leadership leadership begins from a long time ago. It's not something that a degree can give you, you know. <laughs> and so sure. just impressed by by how much you've done. So, you know. Talk to me about some of the recent uh, issues that you've been focusing on uh, and, you know, the victories and challenges around those issues. Totally. Thank you so much. Um, the first one that I obviously want to reference um, is the Resistance Bureau. So I'm part of a team that produces a show called the Resistance Bureau and I also host the show as well. Mm -hmm. So this, the, the premise of the Resistance Bureau is how do we provide a platform that brings together leading African voices around issues of human rights, democracy, and the struggle for freedom in Africa. Mm -hmm. So what we do um, as a team is we identify topics, like we've got a show coming up next week that's called Resisting Double Standards, Can the West Promote uh, Democracy in Africa? So we come up with these topics and then mm -hmm. we ask ourselves, who do we bring to the table well, to unpack these issues? I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you use an iPhone? Yes, I do. Do you, are you on Clubhouse? Yes, I am. 
That's beautiful. Well, let's talk. Let's talk because we <laughs> collaborate on that event. Then that's beautiful. Definitely. Yeah, that's beautiful. yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I was saying that we bring together leading African voices. So we've had topics where we talk about, you know, the integrity of elections, you know, resisting um, dictatorships. And we've brought together people like Bobby Wine from Uganda, Tundulisi yeah. from Nigeria, yeah. and the various other people that are not just politicians, leading yeah. civil society leaders and media activists as well. So one of the things I love about this show, because we started it in July last year, wow. but we've really grown. We've done over 11 shows already. So one of the things I love about this show is that it offers people within countries, you know, that are very, um, that are very, I, I, I could call it dangerous in the sense of there are places like Uganda where someone can't speak a certain way about Museveni, right? Mm -hmm. So what we do by providing a platform at a global scale that unpacks experiences of people in Uganda is that you're giving people kind of some level of security because someone can bring forward their perspective without identifying themselves. And then they know that for sure we're going to talk about this thing. So being just being able to provide people that platform where they can air their experiences and we unpack them and question their leaders. And also not just that you're looking at the fact that you're also providing some level of coverage and exposure, not just for political leaders, but civil society leaders as well. People get to know about the leaders within their countries and building a network of civil society leaders, media activists. I think that's one of the most important things that I'm seeing work here where we're taking advantage of technology. You can do it online and a lot more people can show up, journalists show up, media houses can then interview people beyond that show. So that's the one of the things that I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing, which is my nine to five job is uh, as a program lead at Magamba Network as already um, mentioned. So Magamba Network really looks at how do we use creative forms of activism you know, to, to challenge a democratic and just Zimbabwe. So the program that I'm leading is called Arts for Change mm -hmm. and is looking at how do we work with musicians, how do we work with filmmakers, satire people and comedians to actually build their capacity, you know, to, to advocate around issues of social justice and accountability in Zimbabwe. So I've got two projects that I run within that program and the one is called Voice to Rap. So Voice to Rap is a music competition that we do every year where we run a competition and identify 10 young people that those are like up and coming artists that are socially conscious and want to use their music mm -hmm. to sing about, you know, community issues. So we bring them together over a period of a year. We then help them, you know, connect them with producers, with different musicians in the country. We also have them undergo training around lyric writing, you know, how do you promote your music? Basic, you know, training around how they can build their music. So at the end of the day, the idea is build the capacity of these artists to be better musicians, but not just better musicians in, 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 in the sense of the technicalities around music production, but also being able to empower them to understand social justice. What does it mean? What does accountability mean? What does civic engagement? How do you go into communities and capture people's stories? And then we also have film fellowship, which looks at bringing together again 10 young people every year that then undergo training around documentation. How do you build a documentary? How do you build a film? How do you edit your films? How do you use your phone to capture stories? Mm. So the excitement for me with this particular program is the idea that after a year, you're leaving young people with skills that they didn't have before. You would have provided them a network, you know, that enables them to show their art and you get people identifying them as young people and wanting to work with them beyond just the show. So I think it's, it's just knowing that we're not just equipping young people to be activists or to be better socially conscious artists, but you're also looking at the technicality, because I think it's very important that we build their technical, their technical understanding of music, their technical understanding of filmmaking as well. So that's kind of the two major projects that I'm doing right now. And the last one, because I'm very much inspired by African fashion. Mm -hmm. So all things African print, all things beads. And so one of the things I realized was that I'm a storyteller yeah. and I tell my stories in different ways. With you, by the way. Do I have what? Any of your beads? Do you want to show? Us? I've got my earrings, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll tell you that, yeah. So yeah. this is an earring. This is actually part of a collection that I launched in February Bring under a brand called Umukle. Oh, so that you can see it. Good, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I'll tell you about it. So what happened was uh, I, I thought about how do I use my love for fashion yeah. to tell the stories of resilient women and strong women in Africa? So I came up with a brand last year called Umukle. So Umukle is a Sutu term that means you're beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So this, the, 
umukle ya. So it's umukle and then in isizulu and debele it's called umushe. So the idea for me was recognizing that African women are beautiful. Not just from the way we look, because we do look gorgeous, by the way, mm -hmm. but also extending to the way that we're resilient. I think there's beauty in the resilience of African women. Mm -hmm. There's beauty in the strength of single women that are raising a generation of leaders, you know. So there's different ways in which women are beautiful. Then I also thought about how do I magnify, how do I amplify the beauty of our cultures, you know. So part of Umukle is storytelling centered around culture. How do I go to Nigeria? and use the way they dress, use their fashion to tell stories of beauty of African women. How do I go to Ethiopia? I have a fetish for Ethiopian print, you know? Mm -hmm. How do I go to Ethiopia and use their clothing as well to tell the story of Ethiopian women? So the premise of the brand is to really just build, you know, that storytelling platform for different women, different cultures, but through fashion. So it's about producing earrings that tell the story. It's about producing clothing that tells the story. So the earring collection that we launched this year was centered around five women from Zimbabwe. Mm. So we took um, different women, different walks of life, mm. and then we designed earrings that are inspired by them. So one of them, for instance, the girl I'm wearing, this piece is called Febby. Yeah. So her name is Febby. And one of the things I like about her is that since I've known her, she's always had an Afro, you know? Mm. The entire, I've, I've known her since 2014. Mm. She's always had an Afro. And for me, it's that one thing of a lot of times African women are told that their hair is kind of too kinky, you know, type thing. So just being able to portray a woman that is for the longest time worn this Afro and she looks gorgeous in it. So we want to celebrate women that have natural hair. We also have a piece um, that's also called Chef Rumbi. We've got a young lady here who's a chef in Zimbabwe and she's called Vitiligo. So a lot of people in Zimbabwe don't know the vitiligo skin condition. They don't know anything about it. So you discover that the young girls that get to grow with this skin condition, but they don't know about it. They don't know that they're beautiful with that skin condition. Mm -hmm. So part of the story we're telling is the beauty of African women that have that skin condition. So it's these different women. Others are cancer survivors. Others are business women. So we're like, oh, how do we tell the stories of those women? Because everyone's going to ask, oh, who's this girl? You know? So when you ask who's this girl, when we send you a catalog, it has their story. So that's what Umukla is doing. So I'm using that to tell the story, but it's also business, you know, because I'm making money from it. So when I'm making money from it, I'm employing other people to do part of the work. So when I'm doing that, I'm creating opportunities for young people in my country to actually, you know, find some source of income. And in that way, I think I'm giving back to the community. Right. You are. You are. <laughs> wow. I like it. I love it. I love it. Thank I want you. to be able to wear some of the things that you're making. Definitely. One day. So, you know, one thing that I love asking uh, guests that join me for the African Father in America podcast is what a father figure means to them. Because uh, the, the really the core of this podcast uh, for me is to inspire young African fathers, young men, and also older men, older men, stronger pillars to our community, to be present for their families, and to be present for themselves, you know, to take good care of themselves. So if you had a chance to look at all African men in the world, from, from Africa to Brazil to America, what would you tell them? Yeah, you know, like the craziest thing is that on Instagram, there's a page I follow that's called Black Fathers. Mm. I, have a, I love Black Fathers. I love Black men. Um, I, I love seeing Black men that take responsibility. I think that's one of the most fundamental things I would want to tell them that it's very important that you're present for your children because some of us were raised by single mothers and grandmothers and we turned out fine. But there are some that were raised in the same circumstances that didn't turn out fine. You've got kids that commit suicide. You know, you've got young girls that end up getting pregnant in their early years of high school or late primary school. You've got a lot of things that go wrong simply because a child failed to, you know, have a father at home. And, you know, sometimes these kids don't talk about it because normally 
you know, when you're in a setup where you're provided for, you know, your mother is providing for you and things like, you can't go to your mom and say, I wish my dad was here. It's almost like you're disrespecting the role they're playing in your life, you know. So I think the first thing that I would say to black fathers is be present for your kids. And being present doesn't mean that you send them money every month, you know. Yeah, you buy them toys, you buy them this, you send them to fancy holidays while you're not there. Being present means being physically there, you know, for your kids so that you can see your child when they come back from school and they tell you I was bullied at school or I was beaten up by this person. Just being there because they know when they run home after school, they are running to some form of security, you know. Mm -hmm. And it also comes in to say being there psychologically because you can be physically there, but you're the kind of father that your child can't approach and tell you, I'm going through this. So I think there are different levels at which those black men can be present. Mm -hmm. And I think also you need to be present as a husband because it matters to your kids. The way that you treat their mother sets the pace for how the boys treat girls in school even their own sisters. So I think fathers have, I mean, it was intentional for God to make sure that there is a mother and a father. So you cannot expect, I don't know what you expect to play the role for you when you're not there. So I think the most important thing that I can say to black fathers is that be there. And I think the other thing is when we're talking about women's empowerment as well, just demystifying certain stereotypes around what women can do and what men should do. You know, the stereotypes around masculinity, a man can't cry, a man can't be expressive, a man can't be this. I think one of the things that we need to really, I don't know, build our black fathers to get to understand is the fact that it's okay for a young boy to express himself. Mm-hmm. It's, for, it's okay for a man to express himself because we've got a lot of young boys, mm-hmm. we've got a lot of men that are very aggressive, you know, that are very abusive because they can't say it. So they prefer to show their strength by beating up women or by being, you know, violent in different forms. So just being able to get black men to understand that there's this thing called talking about it. Mm. And it's okay for you to say, no, I'm not happy about this or I'm feeling this kind of emotions. It doesn't make you less a man. If at all, it opens you up because as a woman, I'm able to come to you and know that my husband is willing or my boyfriend is willing, you know, to talk to me and we work on it together. So I think black men need to move away from the space that was defined for them where society said you cannot cry because you're a man. That's nonsense, you know, because we've lost a lot of men because of that. Men that are having to fake it every day to look like they're strong. You don't have to be strong because at the end of the day, we lose you and it becomes useless that you were strong at that point. So you commit suicide and you're gone or you become violent and you're having to be imprisoned or something like that. So I really want to see black men trying their best, you know, to be everything that can protect their kids, to be everything that can be a protection even for their wives, you know, because, yo, it's it's kind of hectic. You know, I had a conversation on Clubhouse um, just this uh, just yesterday afternoon and we're talking about the perception of men around women that drink, you know. And one of those guys comes in to talk about how as the men of the house, there's certain things I don't let my wife do. I can't let her go out. If she wants to drink, I'll buy her beer, whatever, and she'll drink at home. He talks about how he can go out and come back at 2 a.m. There's certain things he feels he can do. And even talks about how he's the provider in the house. He's the one that goes to work and does those things. And I'm like, do you realize we're in a century where I am literally working more hours than most men, you know? We're looking at a century where women are actually out there making the bag. And this assumption that as a man, you're a provider. Look at families that are raised by women. They're providers, they're men in the house. So I think for me, it's just being able to move with the times and accept that we're in a different space altogether where women are not just at home taking care of kids. We're out here hustling as well. So let's hustle together, you know, with some form of mutual respect because when you respect me as a woman, I mean, honestly, it's easy to respect or submit to a man that respects you as a woman. But if he doesn't have that ability to lead without trying to prove that he's a man, it becomes very problematic. So, yeah, I want to see more black men winning because I really love black men, like really appreciate black men. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, now when you, from where you are, are you in Harare? Yes, I am. Yeah. So from Arari, when you think about Africa, mm-hmm. do you think Africa is now and uh, uh, and how can we change the narrative about Africa and make it 
you know, the the, the greatest place that it has ever been because, you know, Africa is the richest continent in the world, but it has some of the poorest countries, communities, and living conditions in the world. How can we change this narrative? But what do you think Africa is now? Mm -hmm. How can we change it? Yeah, I think the first thing I wanted to say that would sound very crazy is the fact that the Africa Africa is the future of Africa. You know, the, the resources in Africa. Yes, yeah. Africa is the future of Africa. The resources we have, the natural resources we have, yeah. you know, the human resources, the ideas within Africa, the culture in Africa, the systems of leadership in Africa. Yeah. That is the future. It's about how do we look at our languages? How do we look at our indigenous knowledge systems, mm, you know, yeah. and begin to build on that? Because, you know, things like medication, the COVID-19 situation came and it's almost like the whole continent is waiting for the West to provide for us or China right. to provide for us. But we're coming from in Africa where at some point there was no Western country. There was no there was no China in the picture, but we yeah. still may do. You know, we knew the trees that gave us medication. We knew the roots that worked for us. We knew everything that worked for us. But at some point, that kind of changed because someone was taking over and telling us what worked better. And sometimes these guys are coming to Africa and finding these roots that we used to have. And they patent those things. They own the production of medicine right. from our own resources. Right. So I think the future of Africa in terms of health in terms of our economic prosperity, in terms of our academic prosperity, it comes from here. Especially if you look even academically, you know, sometimes we, we overemphasize Western education mm -hmm. and forget that, you know, look at Egypt, you know, you'll talk about the building of pyramids, the architecture that started in Africa. You look at Mashingo, the great Zimbabwe. There is so much in our continent, you know, that inspired this Western education. Mm -hmm. So until we get to a place where as Africans, we begin to look at ourselves as the source of some of these things that we go to the worst to look for, we will continue to wait for the worst to give us what to do. And the other thing I also wanted to mention about Africa is that I think we, we've got enough manpower, yeah. you know, we've got enough human resource to build Africa. But sometimes you, you look at the fact that the leadership we have doesn't have the political will to make Africa prosperous for everyone because a prosperous Africa or an empowered Africa means that we get to chalk off really some of those leaders that are wasting our time or that are liability to our development. So they can't make sure we all benefit and we're all smart enough to be leaders because, hey, you will take them out. So I think that's the biggest challenge we have, a crisis of leadership in Africa. Right. So when we begin to build a generation of young people that think beyond the now to say, I don't want to just be president here now because it almost feels like I want to benefit from the system. But how do we build an agency among our young people that says, I want to build an Africa that will benefit my kids 50 years from now? How do we begin to build that kind of sustainable leadership? Because if we build sustainable leadership first in the minds of our kids as they grow up, they take up positions in our society and you know for sure. You're building leaders of integrity. You're building transparent and accountable leaders. So I think that's something that we, need, we really need in Africa to actually change Africa. And then there was a question you asked around changing the narrative. Like I mentioned earlier that I'm a storyteller. And one of my passions is telling the story of Africa. African women, wherever I travel, if I'm in the United States, for instance, there's a, this one crazy thing I always do. When I came to USA in 2019, I was there for just a period of two weeks. In that entire week, uh, in that entire two weeks, I was wearing African print only. Mm. I wore African inspired earrings and I had my dreadlocks there. <laughs> so there was always this question of do do Africans wear this? And I'm just like, yeah, this is this is kind of our signature clothing. So sometimes you're wearing the South African print, sometimes you're wearing the Nigerian print. So for me, it's always this opportunity I get when I step out of Africa to yeah. tell the African story. The reason why I feel it's so important for us young people to use our fashion, to use our music, to use our films, to use, um, you know, our education, you know, to tell the African stories because we get the opportunity to correct the narrative. When people think of Africa, they're still thinking of this dark continent where people are poor or probably walking around in animal skin and we're writing this. And I'm just there like, people could go online and Google, you know, but they still don't, they still choose not to know the truth about Africa. 
So yes. we have a responsibility to shift the narrative, not just for the worst or people outside, but for ourselves as well. Because when we begin to see Africa in light of a prosperous nation with people of culture and values, mm -hmm. we will begin to want to be proud of this continent and want to build this continent. So I think the last thing I want to say around this issue of Africa is that the reason why they left their countries to colonize Africa, mm -hmm. the reason why they left their countries to take men away from Africa is because they understood that we had something that they didn't have. We still do. Mm -hmm. They understood that our men and women had the, the ability to work and build civilization. A civilization that we admire today was built by African people. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a responsibility as Africans to ask ourselves, like, why did they come here? It's because we've got everything around us. So how do we begin to intentionally take advantage of this Africa that God has given us with rich natural resources, with rich human capital, the diversity of culture that makes us really amazing people? The indigenous, I'm always high on language and indigenous knowledge systems because when something comes and it's called chloroquine, it sounds a little bit foreign. But if it's got an, a word in, you know, in our regions, that's like if it's Ndebele or Tswana or, you know, Igbo or Swahili, if it has a name in that, people know about it. Mm -hmm. So the reason why our kids don't know about a lot of this medication is because it comes in languages that they don't understand. But when we begin to take responsibility as Africans to go to our elders and say, what was this called in, our, in your language back then? What was this called when you were growing up? We're beginning to expose young people, you know, to the natural, the natural resources we have that they can use to build medication, that they can use to come up with, you know, I don't know, different forms of science that we need in the world today. So I think we need to tap into the older generation. We need to tap into our archives and our history and say, Oh, what was this called? Because I can tell you for sure that everything that comes from the worst that is in Africa had an African name. But because someone told you that we discovered this, no, you didn't. It was already there. You just gave it a name. So let's own our continent, take advantage of it, and build this because there's a future in this. Man, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I'm doing a lot around changing the narrative about the continent too. So we should connect every day at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on, on Club. Mm -hmm. I host a room where we discuss a new, a new African proverb every day. We mm -hmm. get African wisdom. So we, get, we start our day with some African wisdom. And the, the community is growing. You know. That's exciting. Yeah, it's, it's so amazing. Anyhow, one day you should join us. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about uh, Women's History Month. You know, uh, you know, when I think about Africa and I think about some of the most powerful women that have come out of the continent, I have to think about Winnie Mandela. I have to think about <laughs> Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. I have to think about, um, you know, uh, Wangari Mutai, you know. Of course, I have to think about you. I have to think about Lupita Nyong. Who else? Tell us a few people that you'd like to just give flowers. Yeah, so there's so many. Like, I love that we've got strong women in Africa to reference because when young people know that there's women like them that come from the same place as they come from, they're inspired to become because they're saying possibility. But one of the things I always say when I'm given an opportunity to talk about strong women is I don't, I, I, I take it away from the high level woman, you know, mm. the woman already in the, in the spotlight and talk about women in my community. That's I grew up in a high density suburb called Ngulumane in Bulawayo, right. which is the second largest city in the country. Right. So for me, my heroes are the old women in Kolomani, yeah. that raised people like me. Yeah, because know. some yeah, some of us grew yeah. up in a space where TVs came a bit later in life. We were seeing these women every day. A lot of them were single mothers raising young people that are leaders today. Yeah. So for me, that is, that is where the inspiration, because without these women as primary sources of motivation in our lives, I don't think we would be here talking. No, I don't think no, a lot of those yeah. young people would be taking up space. Yeah. yeah. So I always want to reference, especially the grannies in my community. I will, yeah. you know, when I grew up, I wasn't just raised by my grandmother. Everyone in my community took a, you know, took responsibility. But even now, yeah. when I go back home, 
the level of pride is not just in my grandmother, but in the community, because these are the women that invested in you, that taught you, that disciplined you in the streets when you're walking. Mm -hmm. So it's those women for me that inspire me. So those are the first people that I want to give a shout out to the grannies and the hoods, you know, the single mothers that are raising our kids. Shout out to you because I think you're doing really great. And I mean, look at us, we're turning out just fine. It's because you raised this. And then the second group of people that I also want to shout out, especially women, are our teachers in schools you know so when you're coming from a home you know some kids came to school from abusive families but we never got to see that because they are seeing role models in their teachers they're teachers that became mothers for children mm -hmm. they're teachers i talk to now that taught me four five years back and i call them mothers because that's the role they played in my life so shout out to the teachers as well that gave us you know the opportunity to dream and to know that we can become. A lot of my teachers really told me that I was born for greatness. It didn't make sense at the time because, I mean, I'm coming from this, you know, not so rich neighborhood. And, I mean, it doesn't make sense to tell a child about greatness when they don't even know who they are. Yeah. But they're teachers that walked with me. There's one particular woman I really want to give a shout out to. Her name is Mem Masego, Machidiso Masego. She's teaching at Founders High School. She was my debate patron in the last two years of my high school. And even though she wasn't a teacher in any of my subjects, she knew I was passionate about debate. She knew I was passionate about junior parliament. And she's that one woman who, when things got tough, I went to. Like, I would just go to her and say, this is where I am. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And she used to know what to tell me, you know. When I was, all the tears I shed in that school, it was in her office, you know. She stood with me and she was more than a mother to me. So I always talk to her now and I tell her that, you know, you literally raised me. You inspired me to continue pushing. And here I am now coming back to you and saying, how do I work with other young people that you're working with to inspire them? Because I know that you're doing a great work with those young people. So I really want to shout out to the teachers. But then outside as well, I would want to shout out to two people, two women that really inspired me in my professional work. One of them is the first woman that hired me in 2018 as a program associate at their organization. Her name is Samgeli Kumalo. The funny thing about this woman is that when she met me, actually when I went to her office the first time, it was in 2015, and there was a debate in West Africa that I wanted to attend, but I didn't have money and I was in public school, so we didn't have the money to send kids to those kind of competitions. Mm. So when I went to her, I told her that I'm very passionate about debate and I want to debate in a competition in West Africa and I know I'm going to win. That's literally what I told her, right? So one of the things I love about her is that she, didn't, she saw the passion. She knew there was something in this child. She didn't even think twice about it. She's like, it's fine. We'll talk to the team. Come back on this day and check what's up. I went back and they funded my trip to West Africa. I literally got a full ticket paid for me, you know, by people that didn't know me. When I came back home, I had the title. I was best speaker in Africa in 2015. And I went to her and I told her, I'm like, I told you I'm bringing this home. And I did bring it home. So from that time in 2015, right up to 2018, she was providing opportunities for me within her organization. And at some point she hired me as an employee. And I worked for her for eight months. So now I moved away, obviously, to a different space altogether, but she's still the woman that writes recommendations for my academic uh, program. She's still the woman that writes recommendations for the new jobs I applied for. She's still the woman I go to when there's opportunities and I don't know if I should take them. And I'm like, what do you think about this? So it's that woman that saw greatness in me when it didn't make sense. It sounded like more um, just this young woman um, excited about getting to West Africa. So I really want to shout out to her. And the last woman I want to shout out to as well is, her name is Angela Wambuko. She's from Kenya. Mm. Um, she was my country director for the International Republican Institute when I started work in Arare in 2018. Mm. And you know, one of the things that she told me from the time that I got into that job was, Mandate, I started like you. Mm. I didn't have so much of qualifications that you sometimes would feel you don't have. But one of the things that I had was the ability to work the extra. Like, she, she's one woman that really works on that. She's the boss that makes you feel like you want to do more because she really works hard. And she was telling me that if you keep on working hard, you will grow in life. So she's that woman who was a boss to me. She was a sister to me. She was, you know, the inspiration, the role model. Now she's, uh, she's working in Nigeria. She's the country director for Nigeria. But one of the things that continues to, you know, to, to function for us is that when there's an opportunity that's coming, she's a woman I go to and say, hey, can you recommend me for this? Hey, I'm doing this. What do you think about it? So for me, it's that ability of women to see something in you and push you every day to find that. 
So I think those are my heroes. My heroes are everyday women that are feeding into the mandata that I'm becoming. So shout out to all of them. Thank you. Wonderful job. Wow. Now, how can people stay connected with you? Um, so there are different ways in which people can stay connected with me. Um, so if you go on Clubhouse, I am at Mandate Queenet. So just look for me on Clubhouse. And then if you go on Twitter as well, I am at Mandate Queenet. And then if you go to Facebook, I have a Facebook page called Mandate Queenet Mlojo. And on Instagram, I'm at the Radical Mandate. But the other way in which people can connect with me is obviously... If they check out my brand, Umukle, you'll just check it out because it also talks about me. And I have a blog as well. I have a fiction blog that I write on that's called Radite. So you go to www.radite. Radite is spelled as R-A-D-I-T-E-S. So it's www.radite.com. Just check out my blog. I write a lot of interesting stories about experiences of people in Zimbabwe and in Africa in general. So yeah, you can connect me on that. Well, thank you so much. If you're joining us now, we are coming to really the end of our conversation today. I, w I was having a conversation around youth activism with the incredible Mantati Maloshua, who is uh, the program lead at Magamba Network. Uh, and Mantati was the best speaker in Africa in 20 Yeah. I had no idea. But the story began when she was seven years old, you know, going through a lot of challenges, being raised by a single mother and a grandma. But, you know, just the things she has gone through, you know, you should just watch uh, the rest of the video if you're joining us now. But I want to give you a chance to ask me one last question before we wrap up our conversation. Um, my question to you would be, what's the biggest mistake that black fathers keep making that makes them, you know, like, what's the biggest mistake that they keep making yeah. that if they fixed, I think they would be better fathers to kids and better husbands to their women. You know, I think uh, what, what's the biggest mistake we have is that when our leaders, you know, when I speak about uh, father figures, I also talk about our leaders, like our presidents, you know, our athletes, you know, our musicians, the people that have taken, that are now big and they are supposed to be representing fatherhood, you know. Uh, when they, when they don't have integrity, when they don't uh, have patience, uh, and when they don't take care of themselves, they can't have all these qualities that we expect them to have, you know. And a lot of them are also people who are recovering from traumatizing upbringing, but they're not seeking help, you know. Uh, the problem, the mistake our black fathers make globally, uh, and this is also extremely impacting our leadership in Africa, which is our biggest obstacle to progress, is that most leaders don't even go for mental health uh, consultation. They don't meditate. They just eat chicken and, and ugali. And they don't, they don't take good care of themselves, so they can't take care of their families and the countries and their work. So they die young, you know. So they, they want to be corrupt because they know that they want to grab everything before they go. You know, they're in a hurry to leave. But if you take good care of yourself, if you take good care of the earth, why do you want to leave the earth? You know, <laughs> if you know that yeah. you're corrupt and you're not taking too much than you deserve, then you can go and eat with people on the roadside and, and nobody will bother you, you know. <laughs> we want leaders, sure. that, leaders that are accessible. Mm -hmm. And I hope that our leaders can be who black fathers and young youths can look up to and say, oh, I want to be like Swans, you know? So for me, me at a personal level, I'm just practicing step by step, day by day, but it's hard work. And I understand why many people cannot really uh, do it, you know? Because it's hard, it's hard to sustain. It's not easy work. You have to be dedicated. And you have to find a family that also believes in you, that allows you to make mistakes sometimes. You know, so it's hard work. And those who are succeeding, 
you know, congratulations, keep it up, inspire others, tell your story. The other mistake is, you know, mental health, people don't see it. The other mistake is those who have succeeded as good fathers and responsible leaders, they don't tell their story, they're just one, you know? So instead of using social media to tell their stories of how they're gaining and how they're supporting their families and their communities, they just share food and when they go to the you know? So they should know how to use social media to inspire other people so that we strengthen our community. That's powerful. Yeah, like it, it made us so much because like we've got young boys that don't have a progressive view of women. Like I think when Black Father's role model, what it, it means to be a man in a community, yeah. what it means to be a father, it, it sets the pace for the younger boys because yeah. when I see my, mo like my mother getting respect from my father, when I see another woman disrespected outside, I'm able to stand up because I know what it means for a woman to be respected. But when, when all I know is disrespect and violence at home, it almost feels like it's the way of life. So when I'm out there, I will disrespect my girlfriend, I will beat up my girlfriend and all those things. So yeah, I think we do need black fathers to pull up their socks because, I mean, we look up to them. I do. <laughs> we do, we do. And I'm sure there are many who try their best. And even myself, I know I still have a lot of work to do, you know? Yeah. It was really nice talking to you today, you know. I wish we had more time. I wish, you know, we have to do it again, you know. We have to do Yeah, it. definitely. Yeah, uh, and I, you know, I just want you to know that we, we, we did it, you know. We talked about this months ago and it mm -hmm. happened. And I want you to know that I'm proud of you. The work you're doing is important. Keep doing it. Thank you. Um, you know, if there's anything I can do for you, support if there are ways we can collaborate let me know if you have anything coming up if you have a book if you have an, a project this is now your platform just let me know thank you you know we work together on another episode you know mm -hmm. yeah and thank you so much for having me of course like it means so so much um like i was telling you that this is the second podcast i've been on that's totally by man and centered around building responsible men. And I think it's one of those important things we need in society where those empowered women come into spaces and talk to those empowered men. Right. And we talk about how we can build that coexistence of empowered men and women. Because I think there is so much so much hope for Africa. Personally I've I don't know, I've there's because I'm always there like if the goal is to leave, if all of us leave there are people that really want to come to Africa. They will come back and replace it. So the opportunity that exists is for us to build an Africa that will sustain our kids. So, yeah, they definitely work. Thank you so much. And thank you for all, right. all of you who joined us on YouTube and all of you, all of you who are going to watch, uh, listen to this on uh, iTunes and other podcasting platforms. Uh, my name is Simon Javan Kelo. I am currently in Seattle, Washington, but I'm from Kenya. And today I had a wonderful conversation with my Zimbabwean sister, uh, Mantati Mloshua. So with that, we are going to wrap up our conversation today. See you next Saturday for another episode of the African Father in America podcast. Thank you so much, Mantati. Thank you. Thank you. Father in America. Ah, tu dis que c'est tu dis que c'est tu dis que c'est tu